So for nine weeks, we have been doing a series of messages called Rediscover Church. So we're finished. And so a lot of you, when you walked in today, uh, you probably went to the left side and you got a bulletin. And you forgot to turn around to the right side, right side, and pick up a sermon outline to where you could follow me. And you could just actually fill in the blanks. So, um, Harold Dean, you don't mind grabbing those if you would. They're on the right side there and uh, just pass them out and so we'll talk to them. So, this comes to the point because now for the next month, we're gonna take what we learned about Rediscover Church and we're gonna talk about the manifestation of your life mission. How many of y'all remember watching Mission Impossible? Remember that show? They would always come on and, 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 and there, it would be, um, I think it was Mr. Peters or something. And there was a recording. Who was it? Mr. Phelps. Mr. Phelps. What was the guy that played him? Uh, Peter Graves. Peter Graves. See, that's why I called him Mr. Peter. Yeah, so Peter Graves played him. Uh, there was another guy that played, played him before Peter Graves when it first came out, and then, then Peter Graves uh, was one of the, the people, and then he took over. But remember what, it would always come up, and it would say, okay, M Mr. Phelps, I've got this assignment for you, and here's what I want you to do. And as always, you know, you can, you can accept this or reject it. I never one time ever saw them reject the mission, right? They always took it. And about that time, what happened was uh, the, the cassette tape would just disintegrate and go away. And so they had to basically, in their mind, remember what this assignment was. It wasn't written down. And so they always had to figure out, okay, this is our assignment, here's what we're gonna do. And, and so the same thing is true with God. You see, God has a mission for all of us in life. And when we start talking about, you know, rediscovering church, this is the way we do our mission and how we do those things as God has brought all of us together. Because what happens is, a lot of people believe that you were put here on this earth to live your life, your choice. You decide what you want to do and all of the other things. And, and basically, you're gonna live it by yourself. But the problem is that when we try to live by ourselves, it doesn't work too well. We actually need a bigger God to help us Figure some things out as to, as to what's going on. Because we were made for more than a simple purpose of making money. And I know that's, that's what a lot of people think, you know, it is, well, my job is, here's, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna go out and I'm gonna make money. And the more money I make, the better off my life is going to be. And, and I, unfortunately, um, that's not true. Uh, there was a lady that just died um, who was a, an actress. Uh, she was, uh, her and Ellen Degenerate, she was with her for a while. And, and so she was a good actress with a lot of parts, great movies, had some money, lots of money, but was driving. Crashed her car. And the car went into a house and caught the house on fire she died. Money didn't save her. Money didn't make her life better. As a matter of fact, it really made her life worse. And so sometimes what we do is we think, well, if I make more money, then I'll be able to retire quicker. 
And the problem is that a lot of times when we make more money and we decide we're going to retire quicker, we find out that all of a sudden when we retire, we don't have enough money. You see, retirement is not like a job where you get more money. Oh, they give you, I'm sorry, they do give you more money, don't they? They give you a, a cost of living allowance, uh, like $17, $18 more a year. Divide that by 12 months and tell me how much more you get, you, you know? So, so they, yeah, I, I forgot, you do get raises. But working, you, you, can, you can decide, you know, hey, I, I need more money so I can go get another job and all of these things, and I can retire. And, and so that's what everybody lives for, is everybody lives to retire. And you find out that when you retire, it's not as good as you think it is. Because all of a sudden, you were going to work and things seemed to work. Now you're sitting at home and things don't work anymore. You, you, went, you go to make a step and all of a sudden, that step just isn't the same as it was the day before you retired, there's something wrong here with the ankle or the knee or you, you just slept wrong, you know. Uh, it was my first day and I decided I was going to sleep all day. And, you, you know, and I, I, I did that and I, and I got up the next later on and I couldn't move because I was so sore everywhere. And, and so it's, it's there. So what we do is we think that what we'll do is we'll make money, we'll retire, and we'll die. Unfortunately, those three things don't always come in that order. And then we go back and we begin to look at what we've done and, and where we've come from. And, and we found out, you know what? God really didn't just make me to live for myself. But the problem is I've already gone so far. How can I go back and do something about that? Well, today we're going to give you a chance to go back and do something about that if you haven't. Because it's never too late to start to do what it is that God has sent you here to do in your mission that is there. And so what you need to understand, and we've talked about this before, is that do you know that before you were born, God already planned out your life for you? He says that even before you were in your mother's womb, I knew everything about you. I knew what color eyes. I knew how your nose was going to be, you know, long or big or short and skinny, you know. I knew that you were going to be tall or short. I, I knew that you were going to have blonde hair or brown hair or purple hair if you want, you know. You can change it to whatever you want it to be. I knew that that's what it was going to be. And I had plans for you. I had a purpose for you. And we need to understand that we're not made to do our plans. We're made to fit into God's plan. And every one of us are a piece of this puzzle. And I don't know about you, but I hated doing puzzles when I get down to about the last few pieces and there was a piece missing. That really irritated me to no end. Mine was I always did the outside, you know, until I started working with corner or with round puzzles. That blew that one out of the water. Couldn't do that anymore. So now I got to have another strategy of how do you do this, you know, to, to make it meet. So we've all got a mission. And may I say to you that the mission that you have is God given. And so the question is, do you accept it or do you not? And that's where God gives us free choice and free will. Because the choice is up to us. And we'll share with you in a little more about you might want to make the right choice. Because if you make door number two your choice, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause you some problems. And we'll share with you some of those. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. I, I got slides and they're, uh, uh, I don't know if they're, so Mark's going to, I'm going to try to read the scripture and Mark's going to put it up because the slides that I had, uh, the scripture, you just wasn't going to be able to see. So Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse number, number 10 says this, for we are his workmanship, 
his being God's, were created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, okay? So God made each of us what we are. What we are, not, he didn't make us from a mold of somebody else. And which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So already he's got your life planned out for you. And so now we've got to decide what do we want to do? Because every one of us, our good works, ladies and gentlemen, is our contribution to the world. I hear people all the time, and I say the same thing. This world is a mess. It is a total wreck, disaster. You want to know why? Because the majority of people are living for themselves. If we would get back on track and do what God planned for us to do, it'd be okay. The world would be a lot better place than what it is now. And so a lot of times, we can blame politicians, we can blame the courts, we, we can blame um, jobs, we can blame this, we can blame that. They're not to blame. We are. We're to blame because we chose to do our own stuff. Instead of saying to God every morning, what is it that you want me to do today? Not my plans. These are the things that I've got planned out. But Lord, if you want to change them, change them. But help me be receptive to whatever it is. But God, if this is the plans that you have for me today, then as I follow it, help me to open up and see what it is you want me to do there. Because you've already ordained all of this stuff. You've set everything in motion. You know who's going to be there. You know what needs to be said. You know what's going to happen. So God, let me, let me see what it is that, that is there. So when we understand that our good works is our contribution, you've got to understand that's what's called your mission. Not somebody else's, your mission that, that you're going to do. And what did, God, what did God make us to do? He made us to do good works. Not bad works, good works. So when you hear people say, I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing, I can't do anything right. No, no wrong. That's a lie from Satan. Because what did God say? God said, I made you for good works. And I think he's still in control. Last time I checked with him, I think I got a verbal, I got an agreement from him that yes, I'm still on the throne, you know? And, and, and so I haven't heard anything different today, you know, maybe tomorrow, but I don't think so. So if he's still there, then, then we've got to understand that's, that's what he's doing. So he, he did this. And did you know something? This is absolutely awesome. Most children are not planned. Y you know, it it's, we got married or, or whatever, and, and here's a child. Sometimes, yes, they're planned. But can I tell you something? Every child was planned by God. And there's this old saying, God doesn't make junk. Everything that God makes, I think he said, this is good. Wow. This is awesome. He, he, had, he had made the universes. He had created the angels. And then he starts making the night, the day, the land, the sea, the fishes, the animals, the trees, the plants. And then he said, ah, oh, this is good. Then he decided, I need somebody to take care of all this stuff for me. Not an angel, I, I, need, some, I need someone else. I know what I'll do. 
I'll make someone that has God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all embodied into one. And we'll call that man. And then he looks at it and says, Son, Holy Spirit, I think this is very good. What do you think? I agree. I think this is the best yet. And what did he do? He saved the best for last. Women. I didn't say it, someone else did. So, in John chapter 17, and and, uh, I didn't put this one up there, Mark, but it says, in, in the same way that the Father gave me a mission in the world, I give, this is Jesus talking, I give you a mission in the world. There's nobody alive who doesn't have a mission that God created them for in life. There's nobody. So when someone tells you that you're a nobody, you need to tell them that no, you're wrong. I am a somebody because God created me for a reason. I am someone. You may not like me. You may not like who I am or the way I look or anything else, but God loved me. And he made me the way I am, so hey, you're going to have to deal with it. And then they tell you, okay, you're fired. But Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, he says, if you insist on living for yourself, you're going to lose your life. In other words, he says, you're going to waste your whole purpose in life. And I don't know about you all, but I don't want to waste another day of my life. I've wasted too many already. At the end of the day, I want to know, God, that I've done what you've asked me to do. I mean, I'm tired of wasting. You know, people say, well, let's do this or let's do that. I don't have a lot of time to waste. You know, I, I have no clue, and neither do you. You don't know when God's going to say to you, come on home. So I don't have time to waste. And, and so there are things that we do for fun. Those aren't a waste, okay? Waste is when we sit there and do nothing, okay? So what you need to understand is, is this. He says, only those who give away their lives for my sake and the sake of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. So I don't know about you, but I have found lately what it really means to live. Giving away everything, you know, and just pouring into people. Then you understand what it really is to live. When you're pouring into yourself and just living for yourself, you're not living. That's not living. Living is when you pour into others and you see their life start changing. That's living. That's what God loves, is to pour into us and watch change. Say, cool, they're getting it. So so Jesus tells us that's what it is. Acts chapter 20 Paul writes this, the most important thing is that I complete my mission, the work that the Lord Jesus gave me. And so this is so important for this mission that that's why we're going to take the next four weeks, actually five, to be able to help us to understand what is our mission and what it is we, we get. So when we start talking about, we call, we're calling this whole thing the manifestation of your life mission. And there's a reason for it to be called the manifestation, okay? Because manifestation is really not a word that we use a lot today in, in our common language, okay? Because it's really an old English word that, that was used. But when you go through the Bible, since it was translated from the Latin into Old English in the, in the 14, 1500s and then into the 1600s, into the Old English, 
The manifestation was a word that was commonly used during that point in time. And so you will see this word all through the Bible or all through the scriptures, okay? And what it means is this. We're back to look it up. It means that one day, one day, it's going to be clear to everybody whether you fulfilled your mission or not. Hang on, there's more. You see, there's going to be a day of judgment for all of us. Christians as well as lost people. You've got to understand something. Lost people also were meant to do a mission. They were created by God to do a mission. They are going to stand before God and they didn't accept Christ, so they never, ever fulfilled their mission. We did. We did accept him. And if you're one of those that accepted him, then you need to understand how well did you fulfill your mission. Okay? And the Bible says that everybody's going to see my mission and your mission. See, there's a whole lot of things that sometimes we don't understand. We've got this concept that here's what's going to happen. God is here. Everybody's, everybody's, everybody is, is now in their location before the judgment seat of Christ or the the great white throne. Lost people, gone. All of the people that are saved. You're standing before God. But here's here's what's going to happen. Everybody's going to be outside the doors. And this is the concept that we have is that everybody's going to be outside the doors and then God's going to say, Chuck Cotton, your turn. And I'm going to come in here walking like a great, oh man, I did really well. This is awesome. I get to see God and I'm so happy and excited. Wow, I made it to heaven and I got to see him. Whoa, this is great. And then he's going to say, let's talk. Um, Here's what my plans for you were. Uh, On, uh, what is today? August the 14th. On Sunday, August the 14th, 2022, here's what I wanted you to do. Here were my plans. How'd you do? Well, God, I'm dead. I don't remember that day. (laughs) Well, I'm not, and you're not. So let me kind of refresh your memory here a little bit. Um, Here's what I asked you to do, and um, you didn't do it. Now, I had a list of to-do lists for you that day, and there were 10 items on there, and and uh, you only did two of them. There was these other eight things, and, and, and oh, by the way, uh, these other eight things that I did, I had planned for you, uh, here's what I was gonna give you for doing these. And uh, I can't, because you didn't do it. See, we've got this grandeur idea that when we get to heaven, it, God's going to forget everything. Everything that I ever did wrong. It, you know, now, the penalty for sin is gone. But there's got to be accountability, ladies and gentlemen. And sometimes we forget 
that the day I got saved, my accountability to God comes up. And he's got all of these things that I was supposed to do. Somewhere, someplace, there's got to be that accountability. And we don't talk about it. Why? Because I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about all of the times that I should have done these things, but I didn't do these things. I just, want to, I just want to praise God and I want to worship him and I want to shout and, and, and I want everybody to think that I'm such a good guy and a good person. And I don't want to see them do any, know about all of the other stuff that's there. But God says, hold on a minute. He says, there's going to be, because he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, he talks about that each one of us, according to God's grace, he says, I I'm a skilled master builder laying a foundation and you are responsible for that foundation. Not someone else, you are and I am. And he tells you that you and I have a choice to what we want to build our foundation and our life on. And the question is, what's your foundation? It better be Jesus Christ. Because if it's not him, your foundation is going under. He uses it as a parable and, and talks about it. So, you need to understand something. In 10,000 years from now, gold is still going to be gold. Okay? Silver is going to be silver. And those things are not going to be, go away. They're timeless. And this is where Jesus used the parable or the saying, he says that everything, everything that you are doing is going to go into the fire. Your house, your life, is going to the fire. And you and I are going to be rewarded for what comes out. The stuff that's hay and stubble, it's burnt up. Diamonds will stay. Gold will stay. What did he say? He says those things were, that he's giving you treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt. And he's telling us, this is, this is what I'm giving you. And so we need to understand this. So, if or those things that survive the fire, that's what you will get rewarded for. The things that you did in your life in the mission that God gave you, that will survive. The things you choose to do that God never intended you to do, it ain't happening. You may say, well, Pastor Chuck, I came to church all the time. That's not what he's asking. He's not asking if you came to church all the time. He's asking, what's well, your heart in it? Did you want to come? Or were you forced to come? I was talking to Maggie and, and, and Tammy and, and uh, um, Ellie was there. And they were telling me, every church that Ellie goes by, and she's what, five? Three, okay? Three years of, three years of age. Every church she goes by, she says, Mommy, can we, can we go to this church? Can we go to this church? Can we go to this church? A desire to come. Not like, oh man, it's Sunday again. Where did the rest of the week go? It went by so quick. I, you know, I need some, I need some time off. I, I, I got to rest. I got to do all these things. But let me, let me say this to you, okay? If your life 
if your life is built on the foundation of Jesus, please understand this. If you don't understand anything else, the day I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior, he says that I was made a new creature. Okay? A new creature. And so at that point, where is, the, where is my life's foundation? Okay. My foundation is on Jesus Christ. That's my salvation. That's that life is supposed to be. If, if everything that I do from that point on is nothing but hay and stubbles and the fire comes, what's going to happen? How many places and times have you seen going down the road there were houses that were built on rock or concrete. A fire came along and it destroyed the house. What was left? The foundation. So no matter what you do, the foundation will always be there which means you can't lose your salvation because the salvation is built on Jesus Christ, the foundation. The foundation remains, but if you don't do anything with it, you don't have anything, your rewards are gone. All the stuff that you're building that is going to withstand the fire, that, ladies and gentlemen, is your rewards. That's the mission that you're doing. And this is what he's, he begins to teach us in, in all of these things, that we need to understand some things. And so we're going to talk about it. There are ways to learn things. One way is by explanation. Somebody, like in school, if you had a teacher that was teaching you math, they were giving you an explanation. One plus one equals two. Well, how do you know? You, this is just the way it is. That's the answer. Okay, you explained it to me. Okay, then they went on from there to subtraction, then, then to uh, multiplication and then division. And they explained how to do these things. Then there are some things that you learn that are by experience, things that you do in life. For instance, you have your shoes, they're gonna be tied unless, unless you're over 65, then you get shoes that have Velcro. Or they have fake ties and all you do is slip your feet in them. And everybody thinks, boy, that's really cool. That 70 year old guy can still tie his shoes. <laughs> they don't understand that I have a shoe horn. You, you know, slip that sucker in didn't tie them, they, they came that way. Some of them anyway. But there's other things that you learn that are not by explanation, not by experience. There are some things that you learn by example. Okay? And so, when we begin to start learning experiences from the others, it's, it's less painful. If your mothers and fathers came up and told you there are certain things you shouldn't do, and the reason they told you was because probably they did it, and they understand the pain that it would cost. And so they tell you, you these are some things that you shouldn't do because they didn't want to tell you that they did it, okay? But they just wanted to tell you that it would be painful. So in order to make your life less painful and to grow faster, they told you don't do these things. And, and so you do those. But now 
We have a story that we're going to take and uh, we're going to work through kind of verse by verse because it's only four chapters and it's called the book of Jonah. And we're going to walk through this and show you some things. It's a, it's a minor prophet. doesn't mean that it's less than that uh, important than anything. It's a minor prophet because the minor prophets are, are uh, short books. They're not like the book of Psalms, you know, 150-some chapters. You, you know, uh, Jonah only had four, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about we're going to talk about him. And, and so as we go through here, we'll start in our outline because number one on there is this, that my life mission comes through God's word. That's how I find out what it is that he wants me to do is through his word. Okay? Um, it doesn't come from reading a magazine. It doesn't come from watching TV. It doesn't come from talking to your friends. It, it comes from talking to God through his word. That's how you learn, okay? And, and so, there's sometimes that you can watch TV and uh, you can look at some of these ads and everything. And, and li like for instance, um, right now, all, all of the floods that are in Kentucky, okay? They're asking for money and, and stuff to donate. And you can look at that and say, that's really a good cause. And it is. But the question is, you need to ask yourself is, is God asking me to do that? Our heart gets poured into that. But maybe that isn't what God wants you to do. Why? Let me just kind of share it like this. Maybe you've got a neighbor just across the street or next door. That neighbor's house was not destroyed by a flood. They weren't in the middle of a rain. But that neighbor's life is a mess. And you've been talking to them and they've told you, you know, I, I don't know what we're gonna do. Um, you know, I've got to stay home with the kids because I have special needs kids. I can't work, so I've got to stay home and take care of them. So my husband has to work. Two, three, four jobs. And now all of a sudden, he gets laid off. And we don't know what we're going to do. But you were going to spend $200 to send it to Kentucky. Why not give them the $200? It's a good cause. Sometimes the things that get the most exposure gets the most money. Where sometimes the little things that don't get any exposure get nothing. But yet those might do the more impact. Because why? We, 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 we'll, we're for the lights. You know? Put my name on the list of donors. You know, I've got my name etched in a brick that I gave to this cause so that it's there forever for anybody to walk and see. But I'm not complaining and saying that's not a good cause. I'm just saying sometimes we need to ask God what's he asking us to do. Instead of doing things by, by emotions, because there's a lot of emotions that are there. So we need to do these things. And, and we need to understand that, can I say this to you? I, 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 love, I love getting things for uh, when I do the sermons. I love to do these researches. Let me share a little thing with you. They have done a study. And in this study, they have found that the average human being has between 600 to 700 talents. And everybody asks, 
I can't even count to 700. Where are they? We see, we define talents a lot of times as these things that have this big exposure. But talents come in multitudes of different ways. But the average person has that. And can I tell you why? Can I tell you why that most people don't realize how many talents that they have? Because they don't use them. I was watching um, a thing yesterday. It, it was, and they had a bowling alley out, and they, they had two women that were on the uh, pro, pro ladies pro uh, bowling, okay, and and they were out there bowling and showing people how to bowl. And they were asking them. They said, "How you, you know? How do you uh, get in shape to bowl? You know?" And most people think, "Okay, you, you know, I'm a heavy guy." You know, I weigh 450 pounds. I can bowl. So I just get up there, you know, and I just get that ball in my hand, and I just, boom, all the pins go down. Oh, man, he's a good bowler. And they're talking about that you don't understand that when you're bowling, the, the, uh, the wear and tear that it's on your body every day, practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing, and then going on, on tour all of the time, all of the time, and you're, you're constantly using your arms, your legs, and everything else. They're saying, you don't understand. We've got to be in shape. And I looked at these women. Man, they had, they had some muscles on their arms. And I'm thinking, maybe I need to go back to bowling. But it doesn't help when you only use an eight-pound ball, you know? <laughs> But we were, we were made for these things. So Jonah has 17 verses in it, okay? And, and, it, and it goes like this. It starts out, one day God spoke his word to Jonah, the son of Amittai, okay? And this is how he gets his mission, okay? It's through his book. He's starting to define it. And so there, we're going to kind of walk through this to see if we can find out what our mission is, okay? So when you start... You, if you want to know your mission, you're, you're going to have to get into the Bible. Number two, the second thing about your mission is it's going to require a step of faith. You're going to have to move out of your comfort zone. And I know that's hard. God, you're asking me to do something that I can't do. Let me say this to you. Everything that God is asking you to do, you can't do. If you try to do it by yourself, you're going to mess it up. That's why, Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If I'm doing it by myself, I'm going to wear myself down and burn out. But if I'm doing it through Christ, there is no burnout and it, it will be done. Because why? I'm a step of faith, okay? So when you're going to, when you're going to do something. But you need to understand something about what what God is, is, is telling Jonah to do, and, and we kind of did this. So what does he do in verse number two? He says, I want you to get up, Jonah. And, and the good thing about doing these kind of sermons is I can stop at any time. And I can continue with it the next week, okay? But look at what he said. He said, get up and go to the city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. Now, you, we've always talked about Nineveh was an enemy of, of the um, Israelites. But let me lay it in perspective to you, okay? And let me share with you where Nineveh is today, okay? Nineveh was the biggest and most important city in the whole world, okay? It was like the New York. It was a metropolis. It was not a small city. If you remember, Jonah went, I think, four days or three days in to the middle of the city and sat down or walked through the city for three days, okay, from one end to the other, preaching, 
okay? That's how big the city was. It was a metropolis, okay? It was, to them, the center of the universe, basically. It was the capital of a place called Assyria, which was the Assyrian Empire, which was the strongest, the strongest empire of the day. And Nineveh was on the banks of the Tigris River, which is a place today that we know as Iraq. It's where Nineveh is. So remember this. Who was against the Israelites, still against the Israelites today? Iraq and Iran, that part of the countries of the world. They were against them from the beginning, okay? And, and so Nineveh, if you go to, if you go to on the map, to, to uh, Mosul, M-O-S-U-L, right across from Mosul, the big city in Iraq, is the ruins of the city of Nineveh. You can still see the ruins today. They're still there, okay? But it was a, it was a beautiful city. It had wide boulevards. It had city parks during that time. There were canals, great architecture, palaces and temples. It was probably one of the most beautiful cities in the whole world at that time. That was Nineveh. But it was a very evil, cruel, brutal city. And it was a wicked city. As a matter of fact, they were the Nazis of that day. They destroyed everything in their path. When they treated, they treated everybody with racial prejudice, you aren't them, so you're their slave. You are not their equal. They took everything that you owned and gave it to them. They were not nice people. So you got to understand this. God is giving Jonah a mission, his life mission, to go to Nineveh. And we all get caught up in this thing about Jonah not going and not wanting to go. It would be the same thing as God telling you right now to go over to China and talk to the prime minister of China who doesn't like you. Would you go? You'd feel really hard to go. Sometimes you have a hard time going to even a person that doesn't like you that God is asking you to go and talk to. But think about, he's going to a whole city. He's Jewish. They don't like Jewish people. And he's only one person against a whole city. So sometimes when we start criticizing Jonah, we need to go back and get all the facts Jack, because sometimes we go off, if I can use the old expression, we go off half cocked on something, thinking, oh, yeah, I would have never have done that. I, I don't want to say this, but I'm not a betting person, but if I was, I would bet you that probably none of you would actually go. And if you did, you'd probably be sitting underneath the tree too, praying God destroy these enemies. Because we get scared. We get scared today to do just little things that God asks us to do. And this isn't a little thing, ladies and gentlemen. This is a huge job that Jonah was asked to do. 
And so here he was. He says, I want you, I want you to get up because it's evil has come to them. And so he's going on this thing. Now, first, you got to realize Jonah was in a, a little teeny tiny it, itty bitty village of about 500 people, okay? He's not a city dweller. He's not an urban, urban dweller or an urbanite. And God's telling him to go something. And, and from a little town of a couple hundred people to the biggest city in the world. That's what he's asking him to do. He's out of his comfort zone, way out of his comfort zone, okay? They had dominated the Jews, and they hated Israel. Israel hated the Assyrians, and so here he is. He's going. He says, you know, I like my country. Why can't I stay here? I like my little place. And this is the same thing. So sometimes... We get scared when God tells us to get out of our comfort zone. This is what, this is what he's asking Jonah to do. Get out of your comfort zone. Okay? So what does he do? Is number three, that my life mission will somehow help others. If God's got a mission for me to go on, somehow it's going to help somebody else. Not help me. It's not in it for me. It's in it for them. So God gave him this mission to go down there and do this, okay? And so when you look at the, the second half of this, he says, I need you to go down there and I need you to preach against it, okay? And... Tell them that I see the evil, the evil in their city, and it's come up before me. Now, my question to you is this. Look at America today, and you tell me that it's not evil. And you tell me that God isn't seeing what's going on. And you tell me why you aren't Jonah. I'm sorry, but I think God's telling us to rise up and speak up against the evil that has beset our nation or God's nation, not ours, God's, belongs to him. And if we give it back to him, maybe he can clean up the messes that we've made. He can, okay, I know he can. Because what's going on? I mean, you think about it, the injustice that's going on, the things that's happening to people. Every day, day, people that are being, the control is coming from these who have. And they're calling all of the strings and the purses and all of the other stuff. And, and God's saying, I need you to go talk to them. I need you to go share. Because if we don't, nobody else will. And so God has given us a mission. And God says to them, he says, I, I see it. And this has come up to it. Why, can, can I ask you this question? Why does God hate sin? It, it, it's destructive. But can I tell you why he hates it? It hurts his children. When he created Adam and Eve, they were perfect. Meant to live forever. Until sin came in. And what did sin do? 
It hurt Adam and Eve. It broke the bond between Adam and Eve, and it broke the bond between Adam and Eve and God. It broke the bond between Adam and Eve and the rest of the world. It hurt them. The pain of growing old today. You want to know why? It's sin. People say, no, it's life. No, it isn't. Because there's coming a life where we're not going to grow old. And there's going to come a time when we're not going to grow old and we are not going to hurt anymore. Carter can have all of his liver pills, okay? Pfizer won't be in heaven and neither will COVID-19 vaccines or flu shots or any other shots. The only shots that we'll get is a little shot of grace every once in a while now. We won't even need them because we won't have any diseases. Why does he hate sin? Because it, it hurts his children. It hurts. Everything that's going on in this world hurting is because of sin. You hear people all the time say, why is God allowing this? God's told them, here's my word. If you do this, sin is coming. And when it comes, it is a destruction. If I stop that, then I'm going against my word. It's got to play out. And it will continue to hurt until it comes back. But we need to understand something. Nehemiah chapter, chapter 9 in verse number 17 Well, that's, that's a real small one. <laughs> My eyes aren't that good. They refused to listen and did not remember your wonders you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and appointed a leader to return him to slavery in Egypt. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. And you did not abandon them. I hear people all the time say, God has abandoned America. No, he hasn't. What's he say? You are slow to anger and abounding in faithful love, and you did not, ab and you did, not did not abandon them. God is going to judge evil and injustice. And we can delay it. And so we need to understand something, that God has not abandoned you. There is a way out, and that is to do his mission, and he will do this. Number four, you need to understand is this, that my life mission may scare me at first. I think I've, I've shared with you uh, when I felt the call to preach at, at 16. Now, you all know me now. You didn't know me when I was 16, okay? At 16, I was a, a clown, okay? Uh, I was a cut up. You know, I'd do this or do that, and, and, and a jokester, okay? And a show off, okay? But to get up and speak in front of people, I, I mean, I would lead singing, but I didn't really want to get up in front of people and do sermons and preach. That was not me. It was scared. And can I tell you something? I scared, I'm still scared every day and every Sunday. You just don't know it. People will tell you all the time, you know, a lot of people have said, this guy could talk your legs off or your, your leg off or your arm off or whatever. But ask some people that's really around me and you'll find that I am very quiet. 
But most people would never believe that. And there are times and every Sunday that I get up, it scares me. And it does. Because what if I say the wrong thing? What if I say the wrong thing? And somebody takes it. And they, they twist it to fit their need. Or what if I'm in the moment and something pops into my head and it's not from God? And I say it. I'll finish with this. And I'll, um, I'll just share with you this one. I was preaching uh, the first time. I don't know how long I'd been there in Somerville. And I was preaching one Sunday and I was getting really excited. I was getting really into the sermon. And as I'm getting into the sermon, um, can I spell the word? It's not, it's not a four letter word, it's a six letter word. But you probably wouldn't really say it in a, in a pulpit. I was really in, into the sermon and I said, um, I really got P-I-S-S-E-D off. Now that's not a bad word. But you would have thought that I cursed the Lord out. Because some people thought, oh, look at what he said. And I thought, if you'd only really heard what I was thinking to say. <laughs> but sometimes you do, you get scared. What, what if I said the wrong thing? God, I don't want to ever do that. I don't want to ever give anybody a, a, an excuse not to love you, not to care. And that's a heavy load. And I've asked him, because don't ever let me get comfortable. Because when I get comfortable, I quit doing what it is that you want me to do. And now I'm doing what I want to do. So I only got halfway through today, which is cool. You guys don't even know it, except you see the thing that's there. But there's a whole bunch more here to unpack as we walk through these. Because we are, ladies and gentlemen, modern day Jonas. This four chapters, little book, Oh, I'll give you one thing. Hey, Mark, give me the picture, if you would, please. And I'll share this with you to really upset you this morning. Okay. Do you know what that is? Looks like a big mouth bass, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, remember the book of Jonah says that he was swallowed up by a big fish 
and we all say that it's a whale. It's not a whale. A whale is not a fish. A whale is a mammal. Okay. This is a whale shark, which these things are so big that you can actually fit a, 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 a 66 or a passenger bus of school children in the mouth of that shark. That shark has teeth, but they're not vicious. And basically, um, they believe this is what swallowed uh, Jonah. Because some people say, well, hold on. How could, how could that happen? God can do anything he wanted to. He already made the thing. It was already in existence. He didn't have to create something new. He just used something that he already made. Can I tell you why? I think he knew that Jonah was going to come along. I think he already, worked. <laughs> he already knew what was going to happen, so hey, I'll have this. And basically, they, they just eat fish or, or um, um, plankton, weeds, things like that. Um, they are very uh, docile. They, they don't harm anybody. They aren't vicious to mankind. Uh, the, the, next, the next slide, Mark, is, is actually, if you look down to the left and, and up a little bit, these are divers that are actually uh, scuba divers that are out there uh, playing with this. And then I have one more because this one, this one is an inflatable. Okay, this one isn't real. But the Hindus actually worship this whale as, as part of their worship and, and stuff. But so I gave you something to think about. All of these things that I was taught in Sunday school were so wrong, you know. But sometimes it's just the way it is, guys and gals. <laughs>